All right, let's stand for the reading of God's word, please. And uh, notice chapter 8 and verse uh, 1 uh, through 13. Now, as touching things offered in idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity uh, edifieth. And if any man think uh, that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice and idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For thou, uh, I'm sorry, for though there be uh, uh, that ye are called gods, whether in heaven and earth, as be uh, God many, and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not one uh, man that knowledge uh, for some uh, with conscience of idols unto the hour eateth uh, it uh, as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read through tears. <laughs> but me commended us not to God, but neither if we eat are we any better, neither if we eat not are we uh, the worse. But take heed there, uh, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see that that which is knowledge, uh, had, has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be embroiled to eat those things which are offered to idols. And the Bible says in verse 11, and through uh, uh, thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died. Verse 12, But when, we, when you sin against the brethren, you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if uh, meat uh, make my brother to offend, uh, to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother offend. Thank you. you may be seated. So in, in review, we know that Corinth was a wicked city, a conglomerate of heathen religions, immor immorality, and idolatry. And some of the church at Corinth had been converted from the temple practice, and one of the practices of the day was to sacrifice animals to heathen gods. And they would, uh, they would but an animal or a, or a portion of one, uh, uh, and, and go to the temple and engage in the ritual and then either eat or the cooked meat or go to a marketplace to sell it. And when some of the people were converted to Christ, they, they wanted to complete total break from that tradition in religion and all its practices. So to be a play, uh, to, uh, to the place, if they had been in a marketplace looking to buy meat, they would ask if the meat was offered to idols, or, or not, and so uh, that was a condition they had. Now, there were some in the church at Corinth uh, who had been saved and were never associated with the heathen religion uh, offering of, of, uh, of meat to idols. So the, these converts who had better understanding of the scripture had no problem to eating the meal, uh, the meat offering to idols. So these are a couple of things we're gonna see uh, this afternoon, we're going to see, first of all, the distinction of knowledge. Notice verse 1 through 3 of chapter 8. Now, touching those things offered unto idols, we, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And that's the goal. So think about the distinction. It's plainness and clearness. Knowledge by itself alone is empty. 
just getting information into your brain and you know housing it there is not enough. Biblical knowledge without practice uh, um, is deceiving, destructive, and even damning. So the Bible speaks about deceiving in James chapter one verse twenty two. But be a doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Verse 23 and 24 of James 1, uh, for, it had, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he behold himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. And then it, it also is destructive in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, we also uh, have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So the old covenant uh, killed hope because, uh, uh, not hope, but hope because no man could keep it, causing frustration. And the old covenant killed life because the condemnation for a uh, crime was death. And the old covenant killed strength because it told man of his need to be right with God, but he could not help himself to achieve it. So the spirit uh, of the New Testament is quite different. It starts with God seeking lost man and is a picture of love throughout the New Testament. And it's a relationship uh, that changed a man's heart by writing the new law upon his heart, and it was a relationship that not only tells us what to do, but enables us to do it. So knowledge can be deceiving, destructive, and damning. It's like the Bible says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, knowledge can cause one to be proud and haughty and Arrogant. We've seen people like that who, you know, have a little uh, education. And they come across out there know-it-alls. Proverbs one verse seven: The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if they don't have the fear of God, their knowledge is vanity. It's empty. And fools hate knowledge. In Proverbs one seven, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs one twenty two, and fools hate knowledge. Proverbs one twenty nine. For uh, that they, uh, they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So biblical knowledge uh, without control of the Holy Spirit can cause God's people to be proud. And knowledge and love must be joined together. Here's what the Bible says. Love rejoiceth in the truth. Amen? Love rejoiceth in the truth. So knowledge alone can blow up. Knowledge and love Together can build up. And that's what we want to do in people's lives. We want to build them up. We want to encourage them. We want to edify them. We want to help them. In James chapter 1, verse 21 and, and 25, Wherefore lay upon all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, be not a forget, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. In John 1 and 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Notice it's grace and truth. And that's the order. God wants us to have, receive grace and truth. So grace is gracious, loving kindness, goodwill. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but growing grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we increase our knowledge, we must increase our grace. So that's very important. As you're growing in the Lord and you want to increase your, your knowledge, you've got to increase your grace. And uh, James 3, verse 13, uh, Who is the wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his work with meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where uh, envy and strife is, there is confusion of every good work. 
but wisdom that is from above first is pure and peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So that's, that's very important that the book of James chapter 3, 13 to 18, that speaks about the Christian life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angel and have not charity, uh, and becomes a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body be burned and have not charity, it profit me nothing. So the simplest description of Christian character is love. Think about this, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And that, that's a, a famous verse. It's a very important verse. In 1 John 4, in verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. Isn't that a great verse? That God has to us. And God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So the first evidence of the fruit of the Spirit is love, love for God, love for the truth, love for the brethren, love for the lost. And the church at Corinth was not, uh, was not motivated by the Spirit, but rather by self. And this is a very, very important distinction that we understand what motivated the church at Corinth. It wasn't love, it was self. And they were selfish, self-centered, self-willed, self-motivated and self-designing. And when a child of God is not uh, operating in the Spirit, under the control of the Spirit, they hinder the work of the fruit that the Lord wants them to bear. Now, most people today would have no idea what true love is. Most would describe love as romance, warm feelings, affection, or desire. Many would not say love, uh, that they love someone who only motivated himself as reasons. The standard in which we are to measure true love is God's love. And uh, as the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. And that's the key, that God gave because he loved the world. And love is giving and sacrificial. So one preacher said, uh, it's a sacrifice of self for the sake of others, even for the others who may care nothing at all for us and who may even hate us. So there's the story of a young woman who was desperate and despondent, and she went to see a pastor. And so she told him that there was a man who said he loved her, and he's going to kill himself if she wouldn't marry him. So the woman asked the pastor what, was, uh, what she should do, and the pastor replied, do nothing. This man doesn't love you. He loves himself. He is selfish. So he said, when people start saying, I'm going to kill myself if you don't love me back, girls, I'm telling you, they're blowing smoke. They're, they're, they're lying. They love themselves. I remember one night when I received a phone call in the middle of the night. I don't know why in the world I answered because usually I don't hear the phone ring or anything like that. I'm in, out. My wife didn't answer it. But I answered it. It was a guy that I had been working with, witnessing to him and his wife. And he said, um, Pastor, he said, I'm going to kill myself. I said, all right. I said, do me a favor. I said, listen, I can't come over right now. I'm sleeping. And um, let's, let's talk tomorrow morning. You know what he said to me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you, you should have ran over there. You should have cared about him. I did care about him. He was a selfish individual. But <laughs> I thought the answer was great. Okay. <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord, I don't get phone calls like that all the time. 
Anyway, um, so uh, when you think about the commandments the Lord gave his disciples, let's, let's turn here to John 13, John 13, and then uh, we want to go to John 15. John 13, in verse 34, um, says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, and that you love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So think about that commandment that Jesus gave his disciples. He said that you love one another. There's no excuses, there's no but, but he, none of that. You love one another as I have loved you. Wow. A, a, quite a standard God put on us. And then he says in verse uh, 35, but this shall all men know, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, you love one another. And then turn to John 15, if you would. John chapter 15, and notice if you would, verse 9. And the Bible says in verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so I love you, continue in my love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14, Paul closes out his letter to the Corinthians, and he says, Let all things be done with charity. So we should do all things out of love. That should be the motivating factor. Uh, the child of God has no excuse not to love. In John 5, 5, the hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in his heart uh, by the Holy Ghost which he's given us. So we're taught by God to love one another. And uh, the result of salvation. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 9. And the Bible says, but as touching brotherly love, we need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. God teaches us. God is the one who teaches us. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, follow after charity. Colossians 3, 14, and above all these things, put on charity. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and towards all men. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, and this I pray that you, your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. We are to be unified in love. In Philippians chapter 2, and verse 2, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. This is what God wants for his church. And then you have husband and wives that are divided. You have families divided. You have uh, the uh, brethren divided. It's not what God wants. He said that your love may abound, yet more and more knowledge and all uh, judgment. Fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, have the same love, be in one accord of one mind. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, and let, all, and let us consider one another in, to provoke unto love, and the good works. In 1 Peter 4, verse 8, and above all these things, have fervent charity one, uh, uh, among yourselves, for charity shall come the multitude of the sins. So there's five uh, conclusive uh, thoughts about love. Love is commanded by God. Love is a fruit of salvation. Love is part of a normal Christian living. Love is a uh, manifestation of the indwelling spirit, and love must be practiced to be genuine. So love uh, and knowledge must go hand in hand. The second thing we see is the diplomacy of the apostles' need. The diplomacy of the apostle, apostle used, I'm sorry. Verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things which are often and sacrifice idols, we know uh, that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. So God is coming from a viewpoint of how he sees everything. An idol is nothing. 
Now, we wouldn't have an idol in the sanctuary here. And also we had a, a statue to uh, Brother Marcus, right? And we had a statue of Brother Brian. That would be great. And we have candles in front of them and just light them and all that. I mean, come on. That's pagan. Why would you be praying to those men anyway? Be praying directly to God, to Jesus. So we see the diplomacy of the apostles used, and God tells us an idol is nothing. And, uh, you know, so many people make great deals out of idols. I told you before about I saw idolatry in Bangladesh. There was a little village that we were taking, I don't know where it was, would, would be, and there was a six-arm, was it a man or a woman? I, they had six arms, that's all I know. And that's four more than I have. And so uh, they were building this thing. And it was in a cage. And uh, it was just ludicrous. And there, there's, there was a division over whether or not it was right to eat meat that had been offered to idols. Paul demonstrated the spirit of diplomacy in dealing with this division. Verse 4, an idol is nothing. And Paul, in verse 7, uses tact. How, how be it there is not in every man that knowledge for some and with conscience of idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and this conscience being weak is defiled. So not everyone understands the foolishness of praying to idols, but we reach them and teach them the truth in a spirit of humility. In Acts chapter 20, verse 19, serving the Lord with uh, all humility mind. First Peter 5, 5, and being clothed with humility. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, uh, put uh, on therefore as the elect of God, holy, beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, and meekness of, of long suffering. So we see again the distinction of knowledge the diplomacy the apostles used, and he was very diplomatic. He, he, he didn't want to offend. And uh, he had discretion. In verse 8 through 12, notice, uh, but meat commendeth us not to God, neither but if we eat, are we the better, neither if we eat not, are we the worse. Uh, but, verse 9, but take heed, lest any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block, to them that are weak. Uh, for if we see him, see thee, uh, which has knowledge at meat in the idol's temple, uh, shall not the conscience of him that is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? So we, we see the need to practice forbearance. And forbearance is patience. We've got to be patient with people. And uh, in Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. We shouldn't jump on people because they don't know. And I have to tell you something there. Some people who are young converts, saved a couple of years, they may get some knowledge in the head and they want to just empty your head out about the ills of whatever it may be. That's wrong. That's not how you witness for Christ. You, you know, to witness for Christ, it, it takes like a surgeon's scalpel. And it's very important that we learn to cut and be careful where we cut. We don't make the scar too long. And we've got to be careful what we touch once inside the body. We've got to be careful. And uh, look, uh, you know, I, I could have been called a bull in China shop when I first got saved. And he said, if you're a bull in China shop when we first got saved, what are you now? So, but I, I, I like to believe I've changed. You know, and I, I like to be more tactful. And so why should we, uh, again, have an attitude of, uh, of spirit of arrogance or pride? It's all about grace. And we have to be very careful. Look at the seriousness of this verse in verse 12. When we offer the weaker brother 
we're sinning against Christ. There may come a time when we are right to step in and correct or admonish our, our brother in Christ, but we must do so in the spirit of forbearing and tactful in dealing with the younger, weaker brethren. So there's a distinction of knowledge, diplomacy the apostle used, the discretion the apostle used, and last of all, verse four, uh, number four, the dedication the apostle had toward the brethren. Notice verse 13, please. And the Bible says, wherein uh, if meat make thy brother to offend, I'll eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So there's some questions we've got to ask ourselves, a checklist to follow. And it's very careful. We've got to be very, very careful. So uh, my pastor was not into pork at all. He uh, just cut it off and he wouldn't eat it. And uh, he let it be known, which was fine. And uh, when Liz and I had him over, he had a big old ham. No, we didn't. <laughs> he would be offended. Now, he said he wouldn't have been. <laughs> I would say, um, I disagree with you, brother. So, <laughs> But anyway, he was a, a man who just wouldn't eat pork. And um, uh, I think there's wisdom to that. I, I, we, we eat pork, but very little. And um, so anyway, um, but there's some things we have to ask ourselves as checklists to follow. So first of all, uh, the first question is excess. Is this necessary or a weight that will easily beset us? Uh, expendency, is it what I want to do helpful or desirable? And then there's emulation. First John 2, verse 6, He that saith he abideth in him, on himself also to walk, even as he walked. So are we following and imitating Christ? Uh, our action uh, will not only be good, but also right. And that's a very important question, uh, emulation. Uh, are, are we seeking to please the Lord or please ourselves? Very good question. And then the example, are we setting the right example before others, especially the weaker brother or sister? So look, if, if, if a brother is a vegetarian and he's, he doesn't know he's able to eat meat or maybe he doesn't want to, guess what we're going to have? A big old steak. No, <laughs> we're going to have, a, 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 you know, a salad. That's what we'll eat. And uh, please let us know if you're a vegetarian. Don't we'll decide whether to have you over or not. But anyway, um, that's important. We don't want to offend people. It's not our job to offend people. It's not my right to offend people. So that's, that's very important. And then concerning evangelism, does my conduct draw people to Christ or turn people off? Or, or am I consistent in my Christian testimony? That's, that's very important. Am I going to turn people off because I, I don't celebrate Christmas? Look, you can celebrate Christmas in a lot of ways. You can, you can uh, uh, buy a present for each other. You can sing songs, the holiday songs. You can sing uh, Christian songs. You know, uh, you know, oh, come all you faithful, that's a good song. You can do whatever you want, but to abstain, and uh, when it's practiced, you know, throughout our country, it's probably not the best thing. I, I remember there was a Jehovah Witness as a teacher, uh, and he, he didn't celebrate Christmas. I thought, why not? That's so odd. I, I didn't like the guy. He didn't celebrate, there was something wrong with him. In Mexico, they don't celebrate Christmas. They, they feel it's a heathen, heathen uh, uh, holiday. But in America, they do. I remember talking to Milton Martin, who was a missionary in Mexico and started a gazillion churches down there. He said, if I'm in America, I'm going to celebrate Christmas. If I'm in Mexico, I'm not. You see, and you say, well, you're being a hypocrite. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You know, it depends what country you're in, and it really is important. 
So don't say, oh, you shouldn't have a tree. It represents the, you know, whatever thing is, uh, you know. I remember there was a guy who came to our church and was against a Christmas tree. But he was against everything. He was an ingrate. And uh, <clears throat> when he showed up at my front door one day and knocked on the door, my daughter answered, and I went before the Christmas tree, and I bowed down to it. I went, oh, Tynenbaum, oh, Tynenbaum. Well, he laughed, but, you know, such such hypocrisy. I could say a lot of stuff about that guy, but will not. And then edification. Will my action help me in my Christian growth? Will I be stronger? That's another good, good thought. And my exaltation with Christ be exalted. So God's glory should be supreme purpose behind everything we do. So again, you and I know that an idol is nothing. It's nothing. And yet people, you know, they didn't want to uh, eat anything that was offered to an idol. Maybe other Christians that are more mature wouldn't see any problem with it. But if your brother's going to be offended, that's the key. Your brother's going to be offended, abstain. I trust that was a blessing to you and a help. Let's stand on our feet, please. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for the report on Bangladesh. I pray, Father, we raise the money for Nathaniel to go. I pray also, Father, you bless this message today and help, help us be careful that uh, we not offend.